The Lord be with you. Friends, I'm so glad to be with you finally this morning to uh, be with you in worship after some uh, flight delays yesterday. Uh, But as we begin our session this morning, I want to invite you to stand with me. And as we are wont to do every time God's people gather, we are reminded yet again that our lives and our whole beings are offered in worship and in praise to God. A simple song that simply reminds us that every praise, somebody say every praise, tell your neighbor, say every praise, belongs to God. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Let us sing. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing that again. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Our God, glory, hallelujah, is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Let's take that up one time. Every praise, every praise is to our every word of worship, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. get up again in about three minutes, so (laughs) don't get too comfortable. So we want to organize the conference. Before we do that, uh, I want to uh, say a word of welcome to you and appreciate your presence here. I want to again thank, I think DeAndre may have left the room, I don't know, but for the wonderful worship we had uh, last evening. I'll keep talking about that, but 
I thought it was a fabulous experience, and that was uh, the gifts of so many people, but I appreciate DeAndre's leadership on that. Uh, and that, the leadership happens before we actually get in the room. And uh, they don't just throw this stuff together, as you know. And w months of work went on that, so appreciate that. So I'm going to ask Andrew Beard, who is our campus pastor minister at the Wesley at Southern Methodist University, to come and to pray for us this morning. Andrew? Thank you. Let us pray. Great and mighty and gracious God. God, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for the blessing it is to have another day to live and to love. God, we are grateful for the life that we have, for the breath that we breathe, and for the redemption that we experience. God, as we gather together, I pray that you bless this space. Bless all of us that are here, God, as we conference together. God, let us be sensitive to your spirit. Let us hear your voice calling us. Let us see others in the world as you see others in the world. Let our heart break for what breaks yours, God. Let your spirit be so palpable in this place that we may have wisdom and guidance that can only be divine. God, we pray all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. So, Dr. Clayton Oliphant, who's the pastor, one of the pastors, the senior pastor at First United Methodist Church of Richardson, is our host. He was unable to be with us last evening because Grant graduated from high school, and Clayton thought it was more important to be there than here. That's three and done. Yeah, but he's going to college. You don't know what done is, or you forget. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bishop, uh, members of the annual conference, we welcome you to First Richardson. We're so glad to have you here. We're excited to be hosting. We were hosting a couple of years ago, and um, some of our members got together after we hosted the last time and said, you know, we could do a better job hosting if we just build a whole new building for the conference. We wouldn't have to have a tent out there, and we could just do a better job of hosting. So that you're the entire reason we built our new ministry center. And... Um, so welcome. We, uh, we do want to welcome you and we just ask you if you need anything, if you need directions, if you need information. Um, there are people with those blue teal shirts all around the campus. If you see one of those, they are there to ask. If they don't know the answer, they'll point you to the person who does. So we encourage you to, to uh, find them and, and um, they, will, they will direct you where you need to go. Let me tell you about a special opportunity this afternoon at five o'clock. For those who, who um, would like to do this right before dinner, there's about a 15 minute tour of our garden ministry. And I just tell you that this is an exciting thing. There's an inf information in your packet about this, but our community garden provides over a thousand pounds of produce every year to, um, to our local food pantry. It's one of the most vibrant and exciting ministries. And it's just a way that we're connecting with our community and staying um, really engaged with our community. And I just want to uh, commend you to it. It's a great opportunity to learn more about how to start one of these at your church. Again, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, let's thank First Richardson, which we'll do again and again and again. And we also appreciate the building of the new building for our use, Clayton. Thank you. Uh, nothing's good enough. Nothing's too good for the North Texas Conference. So thank you for that. We appreciate it very much. So word, this is a good time for me to say this. Remember that uh, we are guests in, in, the, in their home. And uh, one of the things that I'd like, I will remind you throughout the day and tomorrow is, is that um, uh, you need to pick up after yourself in here. We, we found this the first year, uh, especially on Monday, to get ready for the ordination service. Um, everybody thinks you've claimed your place for the whole week. You've not. 
so you need to take everything with you when we leave this afternoon and also pick up trash and so that we can make this easier because uh, we'll be turning the room several times and that's important. Again, so uh, say a word of appreciation to the persons who are acting as our hosts, the w- ones wearing teal shirts uh, that can be helpful to you and remember they're here to be helpful and so let's express appreciation to them as we see them and we move through the day. We're going to organize the conference before we move into uh, a worship experience and then um, and we'll do that. So um, Judith Reedy, who is the secretary of the annual conference, will help us move through, um, through uh, the organization of the conference. So Judith. Bishop, I move that the bar of the conference be established as this chancel area and the entire floor of the sanctuary at First United Methodist Church Richardson, and that the visitor section be established as the balcony of this sanctuary. Okay. So that's before you. I want to remind you that means everyone who is seated on the floor is a layer clergy member of the annual conference. If you're a layer clergy member of the annual conference and you're seated in the balcony, you know, I won't recognize you for a speech. You'll be unable to vote from up there. So if you want to vote and participate, you need to be on the floor. All of the guests will be in the balcony. And that way, as we take votes, we're clear about who is who. So this is before you. If you'll approve that, will you raise your hand? Thank you. It's done. Bishop, I move the election of persons to serve the 2017 business session as assistant secretaries be Adam White, Kenny Dixon and Marsha Middleton, and that Dretha Burris be head teller and the teller group serve as appointed by each of the district superintendents. Okay, this is before you in terms of our assistant secretaries, our teller, and the uh, uh, assistant tellers as well. If you will affirm that, will you raise your hand? Thank you. If you oppose, you don't want to oppose that, so that's done. (laughs) Bishop, I move the approval of legislative item number one in our conference workbook on page 16 for equalization of clergy and laity. Okay, that is before you. It was uh, in the pre-conference uh, uh, material. All those in favor of that, will you raise your hand? Thank you. Opposed? Raise your hand. It's done. I have some an- announcements to make that are important to all of you, and that's the location of the restrooms. Uh, to our sides and back uh, in the back and then some along the concourse as well. The snack bars are located in the Shaver uh, Ministry Center. Coffee is located there as well as in the Beverage Center on the side of the sanctuary and donations are appreciated. The Soul Purpose Cafe offers uh, fancy coffee selections for purchase. This morning, Bishop Odin is in the Shaver Welcome Center for his book signing. And finally, uh, please remember to sign in with your district uh, uh, superintendent's admin. And at this time, pull out this lavender card from your uh, book. Yeah. This will be used for the upcoming service. Each, Each package should have this. Thank you. So, Ann Todd, uh, the standing rules. There you are. I I knew I'd seen you, and then I lost you. W, yeah. Good morning, Bishop McGee, members of the annual conference and uh, guests. Uh, Today, I'm bringing the report from the standing rules committee. And this is the legislative item two and three we will be referring to. Legislative item two uh, is brought to you uh, from the conference nominating committee. On the background, the proposed change is a request from the conference nominating committee to provide additional conference-wide representation to the committee as well as selecting a chair from at large within the conference to provide the most effective leadership. With that being said, it is to uh, have the assistant of the bishop to serve as the chair. So the change is in the standing rules that is uh, paragraph two, which reads the conference nominating committee 
is comprised and will take out the chair of the committee, the assistant to the bishop and add who shall serve as chair, the conference lay leader who shall serve as the vice chair, the conference lay leader elect, the district superintendents, and one at large lay member from each district to be nominated by the district and elected by the annual conference. In accordance with that, then in the, the third paragraph, they will re, we will remove the uh, uh, portion of the last sentence with the at large lay member and removing the chair of that particular sentence. Uh, Bishop, I present that as a proposal. For a vote. And we're going to vote now, right? Pardon? We're going to vote now. Okay, this is before you. Are there any questions? Okay, I think you're ready to vote though now. All the yes. You're gonna have to come to a mic. Clara Reed, St. Luke Community United Methodist Church. I have a question. Uh, if I'm reading this correctly, this would become, the chair would become an appointed position, and heretofore it has always been an elected uh, uh, position headed by a lay person rather than a clergy person. So I would like to understand the, the reason for diminishing the role of the laity. I cannot tell you uh, all the thinking that is from the nominating committee. They would need to present their their part of what they uh, are asking for. Did that change? Jeff Lewis. Microphone C. Uh, Jeff Lewis, conference lay leader. Uh, to explain the background of this, we actually, um, in the past, the chair has been uh, someone on staff in the conference. We changed the standing rules when we changed the strategic plan um, and the restructuring of the conference a few years ago. Um, by putting it as the conference lay leader, we also then discovered we are actually the only conference in the South Central jurisdiction and perhaps all of Methodism uh, where the conference lay leader was the chair. Um, and it simply was just too much work. Um, so we have realized over the years, we, we tweaked it last year a little bit, trying to change it. We realized we needed to tweak it a little more uh, to give um, someone who is in the office and has a full-time staff uh, the ability to work on that. We also, if you'll notice though, the, the chair of the committee is the lay leader and the lay leader elect is always also in the committee, uh, as well as the DSs and multiple um, representatives from the districts. So I think the balance is still the same as far as lay and clergy. Uh, it might be off by one, I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look. Uh, but the main intent was that was really the only people who could chair the committee um, need to have that as their full-time job or be retired, and we didn't want to do that to our laity. So that's the reason. Well, again, uh, it, I, obviously it's something that I challenge because I do think it reduces the, the role uh, and the presence and power act actually of the laity. I do observe that you have said that the proposal is that the appointed person who is uh, the assistant to the bishop becomes the chair and then we have a vice chair who is laity. But uh, again, I, I would uh, uh, challenge us from uh, the uh, perspective of the opportunities for a broad number of persons to have that. It is a very select group that ever becomes the assistant to the bishop, and that would eliminate, in large measure, women and minorities to this point in our history. Okay, that's a speech against. Does anybody else want to speak? Okay, I think that means you're ready to vote. Are you gonna speak, Serena, did you want to speak? Serena Eckert, Faith UMC, and current chair and layperson of this committee, I can speak to the fact that it is indeed an inordinate amount of work 
for a layperson in a volunteer capacity. Um, the work of the committee is very collaborative, and I would um, only assume that that would continue to be so, so I would fully support this amendment. Okay. So this is before you. Are there any other speeches? Then I assume you're ready to vote. All those in favor of the rule change as in uh, legislative item number two, will you raise your hand? Thank you. Those who are opposed, raise your hand. This passes. Okay. Then legislative item number three, uh, the background on that particular one is the proposed change is a request from the conference nominating committee to remove the courtesy and resolutions committee from the standing rules. The task of this committee has been absorbed by the annual conference planning team. In doing that, then it would refer to the standing rule, Roman numeral 1B7C, in which the courtesy and resolutions committee and the paragraph with it would be removed. In doing that, then the uh, lettering for the Commission on Archives and History would be C and standing rules would be D. And uh, Bishop, I present that as for a vote. Okay, this comes from the standing, Committee on Standing Rules. It's before you properly. Are there any questions? Are there any speeches? You're ready to vote, I assume. I'm looking at the House. You are ready to vote. All those in favor, will you raise your hand? Thank you. All those opposed, raise your hand. It passes unanimously. That concludes the report. Thank okay. you, Ann Todd. Let's give thanks to Ann and her committee. Thank you. Larry George, the Assistant Bishop, will present the consent calendar. Bishop McKee and members of the annual conference, on page seven of the conference workbook, you will find the preliminary consent calendar. I would remind you that as a, the, the items that appear on the consent calendar are those matters of a legislative item which are only reporting in nature, which do not have financial implications beyond anything that's already included in budgetary recommendations that will be before the conference and do not affect the conference rules. So that preliminary consent calendar is before you. It will be voted on tomorrow afternoon. If you should see an item on that calendar that you wish to have removed, please note that on page six, you are told the process for doing so. To remove an item, you must present to the conference secretary that request in writing signed by five annual conference members, and it must be submitted within 24 hours, which means Reverend Judith Reedy needs to receive it by 8.30 tomorrow morning. This is a matter for information only, Bishop. Okay. Thank you, Larry. We appreciate it. So we're moving into the time of the service for baptismal renewal, and so as we do that, you're going to need your purple card. And again, that was in your packet uh, or your bag this morning. And uh, so as we we continue uh, our work this morning, we want the work to be worshipful, and that is why we begin really with the service of baptismal renewal, which we began last year. Yes. Point of order. Uh, Bishop, you announced the vote in regards to uh, the, um, uh, I believe it was the change on one of the standing rules as passed unanimously. It was not unanimous. I voted against it, but you're not looking to your left. Yeah. And we'd appreciate it if you would. Well, I will, and thank you for that correction. I did look to my left. I didn't see, and so I apologize. Let it be recorded. It was not unanimous. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as I was saying about our time together, we're grounded in our baptisms. So I'll speak more about that this evening, but be remindful of that as we move through our time together this morning. Again, I welcome you. We're glad that you were here. And let us remember, you are not delegates. You are members. You are lay and clergy members of the annual conference. And the equalization formula means it's equal lay and equal clergy. 
And so begin to think of yourselves as a church, members of a church, at this time for this period known as the North Texas Annual Conference. I invite you into a moment of reflection, thinking about the waters of baptism that have called and empowered and claimed and sent all of us and to hear the call to come to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water to be baptized. Oh, yes. Oh, take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water to be baptized. For none but, none but the righteous. None but the righteous, oh, none but the righteous, so shall see God. I don't know about you, but I know, said I know I've got religion. I know, I know I've got religion. I know I've got religion. And I shall see God. Do you love Jesus? I know I love, I, I love Jesus. I know Oh, I love my Jesus. Ooh, I love Jesus. Say yes, I do. Oh yeah. So come on and take, take me to the water. Oh, take me. Diana Masters will give our prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful, glorious day. We thank you for another day above ground, oh God. Lord, we thank you for the hospitality of First United Methodist Church Richardson. We ask you to bless them, oh God, because in your word in Genesis 12, 3, you said you will bless those that bless us and you will curse those that curse us. So bless them, oh God, for all that they continue to do with this annual conference. We ask you to have your way. Let your Holy Spirit 
Spirit be present in each and every person. Oh God and Lord, we ask you to hide our bishop behind the cross so the people will not see or hear him, but hear and see you in him. We're listening for a word from the Lord today. And so, Lord, we say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. So I often receive invitations to preach in churches in the North Texas Annual Conference. And those invitations come in a variety of ways, or I should say for a variety of purposes. Uh, here it came for groundbreaking of the new building that we are enjoying. It comes for an anniversary of a building or an anniversary of a congregation. It comes for, n it comes for a dedication. That means that the church mortgage is paid off. Those are the ones I love the best or it comes for a consecration, consecrating a building to the glory of God. All those invitations come with specificity. If you notice, they're really markers in terms of time and in terms of buildings and edifices. It reminds me that we really do like to build things, and that's good. But there's also a reminder that somehow that um, there's a marker in terms of what that building represents. So two weeks ago, I believe it was two weeks ago, I was invited to come and celebrate and um, preach for the 100th anniversary of the sanctuary of the Van Alstine Church. And as I drove into Van Alstine, I, I, I passed the Baptist Church first, and then I passed the Disciples of Christ Church, and then I came to the Van Alstine Church. And I must tell you what I immediately thought. Ours looks better than the others. But it's not just about looking better, it really is about something deeper than that. Already I knew that, but then members of the congregation began to describe for me their ministry. We, we tend to think, and this is not anything in terms of comparison, we tend to think that larger is always better or best. But authentic and unique ministry happens in a variety of settings across the North Texas Annual Conference that can be very surprising to all of us. And one of the great privileges of being a bishop in the North Texas Conference is you realize about how much, tr how true it is that thriving, vital, authentic ministry is happening in all different kinds of settings. It really is what provides hope to me personally about the work of the North Texas Conference. So this is what I learned. This summer there will be 300 children in the Van Alstine Vacation Bible School. Now look, 300 children is a lot of energy. <laughs> but it's a lot of good energy. There'll be over 100 students who will be going on mission trip this summer. So what the Van Alstine Church has done, which is what needs to happen in every place, is they see themselves not only as a, a congregation for their members, but they see themselves as a community of faith that seeks to embrace and invite everyone in the community, whether they're a member of a congregation or not. It's the way and they begin to tell the story of Jesus so that his story may become their story. It's the way of meeting new people. It's really what we're about. And then I began to think of uh, the appointed lesson for that day on which I preached. Uh, you know it from the 17th chapter of Acts. Uh, Paul has gone to Athens. He has been witnessing there, talking. He's somewhat in a little bit of a scuffle already. It is normal and natural for his ministry, his missionary spirit. And in that he says, um, in front of the Areopagus, I see that you are a very religious people. You even have an altar inscribed to an unknown God. I see you are a very religious people. And then he begins to make his case and his witness to Jesus the Christ. Human, building, human beings like to build things. 
I'm, I'm also reminded as I began to reflect upon that that there was a flurry of activity in Europe uh, in the first four or five hundred years of the second millennium, the 10th through the 15th centuries, it did carry on after that. And in those centuries, the building of churches and cathedrals throughout the European world at that time, coming out of uh, the Dark Ages, they built these grand structures which continue to be built uh, on in. Now, there was something special about the, the spurred people to that kind of activity and what I would call a religious building boom. But as, as something to mark that same period of time, because we are so driven to the West, I want to tell you that in Bagan, which was the capital of the ancient Burmese kingdom, in fact, it was the first capital that brought that kingdom together, those 24 square miles and old Bagan, the capital, they built in that same time period, in a 24 square mile area, on the banks of the Irrawaddy River, five times more religious structures than were built in Europe at the same time. So you see, this is not just limited to the West or to the Christian faith, but it, it's just a symbol about that deep hunger somehow to connect with the spiritual, that deep hunger to find meaning and purpose in life. Whatever they become aware of, it is the desire to connect. And today, if you were to go to Bagan and you, you, you would climb up the Sun Temple as I did one early evening and watch the sun set on the Irrawaddy River and hear footsteps going down the steps of this temple or you'd hear bikes as they leave the area, people going home and see the sun beautifully set on the Irrawaddy River, you would also say, I see that you are a religious people or were once. I've been drawn again then to a reading of a book by Bill Shores. Uh, Bill Shores may or may not be a familiar name to you. He was and is still, he was the founder and still serves as the executive of Share Our Strength. And a number of years ago, he wrote a book called The Cathedral Within, and he began to talk about the building of the cathedrals in Europe uh, in that same time period that we've just referenced and how it is that it really became a way to express human beings' desires and how it is that it really then began to coalesce around the community and how the building of the cathedral really provided something deep and significant for all the people in the community. He translated that into the work of a nonprofit. And in that, he began to talk the same things that, were, that uh, made it possible for people to do the impossible uh, over a thousand years ago, or the same kinds of tools that can be used, or principles, I should say, that can be used in building nonprofits. And then he highlights five significant ones. But I, I read that book again because I wanted to refer to it in terms of what does this have to do with the church? Because the building of the cathedrals then and the way at which he's uh, articulated for the building of nonprofits, really we need to return to those roots in some ways because we could learn something. We could be reminded of something about how we really built the places like this. And not just how we built places like this, but how Paul would even say, walking through here, would say, I see that you are a very religious, religious people. I think that really what we have to do is understand that we are about creating a new thing. That's simply what God's challenge is to all of us. And what it means is, is that we're going to have to move from death or dying to resurrection. Move from death to resurrection. And we need to understand that in order to, become a, in order to move to resurrection, then we have to become an apostolic people. An apostolic people that is more concerned about who is outside these walls than who is in this space. It is a desire somehow to seek, invite, and attract other beloved children of God who don't know that. As I've walked into cathedrals and basilicas, not only in our country, in Europe, I'm a marvel at how they did it. Uh, given that we have modern machinery, we can easily see how it could be done. 
but we don't do it like that anymore. How? How? Well, I still don't know the engineering, and frankly, I don't know that many of us would be interested in the engineering simply because we're not wired that way. That's not a way of dismissing that. But we've come together for a different purpose than that, to talk about principles. One of the things they understood early is that cathedral building was a lifetime commitment. Because when you begin to think about it, when it took hundreds of years to build some of those magnificent places, there are people who began to work on those cathedrals or those large churches and they realized, I will never see this completed. I will never see this completed. You will never see the work of the church completed. Ever. Ever. But what they did is they operated and lived with this grand vision, a detailed blueprint to bring about the desired outcome. So the, really the question for us is, what is our grand vision, North Texas? Uh, we know it's about growing Bible congregations, making disciples for the transformation of the world, but I, I always sort of, I sometimes begin to think about St. Saint, Saint Benedict and the rule of Benedict and I'm reminded that uh, anyone who came to a Benedictine monastery was welcomed as Christ himself. Because the Benedictines never knew, we're told, that you never know that the stranger you welcome may be the Christ. Which comes with a phrase that many of you have memorized that is one of my favorites. God wants to introduce us to people whom we do not know so that we may can introduce them to the God who knows them and loves them. I think it's also important to do a little history of our recent annual conference, uh, something that uh, was somewhat contentious for us last year and it was nowhere near a unanimous vote. Last year we voted to close a church along the 380 corridor I know that uh, some people voted no and uh, for good reasons. Um, there was an average of 20 persons who came to worship there. Most of them did not live in the community or the neighborhood. And frankly, our neighbors, through a series of occurrences, really didn't see our church as very welcoming. But you voted to close it. Now, the interesting piece about that is within a couple of miles, we had started a new congregation that was meeting in a school difficulty getting some traction after a while, moving in and out of school for a number of years is hard work. New church planners who are in schools, would you agree? It is hard, hard work. So what we did is after the closure, then we said that the Crossway United Methodist Church, Gathering Faith Community out of Grace Avenue Community, could worship there. They did some renovations on the building, but there's some outcomes that happen, and sometimes we don't talk about outcomes enough. So the, these are things that happen. So um, pre-move, that is before Crossway moved into the building that had been closed and that got renovated just for their use until they find a permanent home, their average worship attendance at this time last year was 106. Today, after the move into the building over a six or seven month period, their average attendance worship attendance on a Sunday morning is 162. That's called 60% if you do the math. In terms of professions of faith, pre-move, four. Post-move, 11. Tripling. Baptisms, two. Now seven since they moved in. New members, four prior to the move of the first part of 2016. Since move in, 24 new members. I just want you to know the effect your decision had, the outcome, what occurred. So the challenge for us is how do we move from what has been and is not happening to what can be? What kind of courage does it take for us to move from death to resurrection? It also, there's a, there's a, a narrative about that. And the narrative about it is also that the relationship between the church and the community is a good one. Because a sidewalk is built, 
so children can actually walk to the school bus stop. Do you hear me? These are simple things, but it makes a difference in how people who live outside of community faith understand who we really are. These small things are important because each number that is more is about a human being and a child of God that it matters to God. You see, you need to understand as I, we all need to understand that we are stewards not only of the North Texas Conference Ministry, the ministry of the United Methodist Church, but also the ministry of our Christ. This is not about size, it's about pursuing our mission with passion. And our mission is not to help people. I want you to hear that. Our mission is not to help people. Our mission is to proclaim the Christian faith so that that message becomes transforming for them and in that and of itself becomes the way that we begin our own passion of how we do care for people and how we provide compassion. But we are not a social service outlet. We're a community of believers, of beloved children of God. We have to remember then that this is a lifetime commitment that we continually stay on top of what it means to be an apostolic church. But it also means that there's some things that we need to address. The ongoing work of reconciliation and not only in our country, around the world is, is challenging. And it's more challenging today around the globe than it was um, a number of years ago. We know it's also a challenging in terms of our own communities. And so there's conversation of which we've begun to have and a conversations that are deeply important to the life of the North Texas Conference in order for us to be models for the, our communities in which we live. We begin to have conversations with people um, about the matters of race and we realize that the conversation needs to be different as it's being changed. It's about cultural intelligence. And in January, the clergy of the North Texas Conference gathered at annual covenant day and heard a presentation on cultural competence or intelligence. It's something that's happening in universities now, something that's specifically happening at SMU. And so it is a way in which we begin to understand each other and not be dismissive. Let me give you an example. Let me say this. We must move beyond traditional frameworks in dealing with the complexity of our lives together in connection and community. So that in addition to increasing our spiritual and rational intelligence, we will indeed move beyond traditional understandings of diversity and inclusion to seek cultural intelligence. So the Wesleyan ideal that innovation and authentic relationship go hand in hand. And the greatest promise that our initiatives on cultural intelligence provide us is to render moot the old and ineffective dance of, of blame and shame and ignorance and ambivalence because none of us really are. So in a culturally authentic relationship is not about a rehearsal of our past or to ignore the very real structures of injustice that have shaped and continue to shape our lives, our church, our country, but instead it calls us to establish out of our own natures, our sinful natures of relationships, they become honest and genuine and deliberate. I don't know how we're going to get there. I don't know what it necessarily looks like. And those who want a quick solution, you're going to be disappointed because we will not try just another program for the quadrennium and discard it. We'll develop a structure and means that reflects the unique reality of our conference and uh, people are already in that conversation about how that will happen. We will lean on those who have significant skills and work in this and find a way that is sustainable, unique, and most importantly, effective. And so many of our clergy had an introduction. We will do that with laity uh, in, at another date. But I, in the meantime, encourage you to participate in some ongoing efforts like Project Unity in the city of Dallas that we can practice the art of authentic conversation. You could also the same thing, say the same thing in terms, I think cultural intelligence has to do with a whole notion or the idea of refugees. Uh, we, we need to have an understanding that refugees are, are refugees really from, from war-torn regions. I shared in a, a column a number, a couple of years ago, related to our family's own experience. Jones and my experience was really at the church I was serving at the time about a refugee family from Vietnam that we became acquainted with. My parents, who were in another United Methodist church, were so taken with them, they encouraged their church to do the same thing. 
My, my parents, my mom and my stepdad, actually became the primary point persons for this refugee family. In fact, they became the acknowledged grandparents. My stepfather, uh, his name was given, his last name was given as, a, as the first name to the firstborn boy in that family. To this day, I say that I found out the kind of man that my stepfather was because his interaction with a refugee family who spoke no English at the time. It was transforming for him. To this day, my mother is treated like royalty in this family. I tell my brother, we should treat her as well as they do, but I don't think we can match this. (laughs) But she is the guest of honor at every wedding, everything. Because these are people who are given a chance. We tend to think sometimes that refugees are the enemies. But the church in which I served until coming to be with you, the preacher who was with us last night could have testified that just from taking in a refugee on political asylum who's a Presbyterian pastor in the Democratic Republic of the Congo fleed for his life. And they sought like they, as hard as they could to get him political asylum. And they worked with Senator Cornyn and they did everything they could and it took some time. But now today, because of that welcome, of that one person who feared for his life in his own country, serves as a pastor to a community from the Democratic Republic of Congo in the first time at this church at Hearst. They worship in the traditional service at 11 o'clock. They translate from French, I mean from English into French. They participate in the life of the congregation. They've added some excitement to the congregation. They not only do that, but they do it with Spanish speakers as well. It becomes a way to really embody what inclusion is. Just because of one refugee, the people are able to see the church is much larger than they think. If you were to be at Lover's Lane on a Sunday morning, you would see how rich that is in terms of its own diversity. Uh, Two worshiping congregations from the continent of Africa, a number of other persons who are represented throughout the worshiping communities at Lover's Lane. I'm telling you that refugees begin if we really are serious about meeting all of God's beloved children and not necessarily being afraid just because somebody looks different than we do or speaks a different language that the riches that fall to us in terms of our own personal spiritual journeys are rich. It also means that this long, that we also have to begin to understand that things begin to look a lot different. We begin to learn that cathedrals are built not only on the foundations of others, but with the sharing of strengths, as I've just outlined. Uh, in the, in, when they're building cathedrals, it was is not just the contributions of the artisans and the experts, but of everyone in the community. And as I described a moment ago, these communities tend to be more inclusive rather than less inclusive. And the gifts don't belong just to the experts, but it is a shared strength. And the gifts are present in our congregations and communities of faith in our communities in ways that are unimaginable. So the last five years for me has been a learning experience in a number of ways. Uh, These are things I shared with the Council of Bishops when they were meeting here in Dallas just to share with them some of our missions that I used, uh, that I didn't use. I uh, invited some persons to come and speak to them. And right now, everybody wants to steal talent from North Texas. So I'm going to talk about two of them. A number of years ago, as uh, White Rock was uh, undergoing a change in pastorates, um, and I'd known of the attempt to sell the building and to move the church to another place that didn't happen. I need to tell you, I thought it 
should have happened. That happened before I was here. I can understand why it didn't happen. I can understand why people wanted to happen. I think it was mixed. But over a period of time, the White Rock congregation, and this is not to throw stones, this is the way so many of us operate, had spent down their endowment significantly to try and jumpstart their ministry. Some of you may remember the White Rock Church was um, a very, very large church in the North Texas Conference in the 60s, 70s, and the early 80s, and even beyond. And as we were having conversations with Mitchell Boone, who was going to be the new pastor, and it was sort of done before I put in motion a little bit before I became the bishop, I, I said, we're just going to spend down the endowment, and we're going to be in, this, we're going to be in a worse place than we were. Uh, this is how you know that I don't always just sort of want to get my way in a cabinet meeting. That's the one thing I want to tell you. Um, and so I can remember Cammie Gaston saying to me, and Jim Osher, you just need to take the chance. And I can remember saying to Mitchell Boone, I don't believe you can do this. I don't think it can happen. This past spring, I worshiped at White Rock United Methodist Church. It was young. It was vibrant. There was a good number of people in the sanctuary, and the worship had a celebration afterwards. Mitchell showed me around. I, I, I saw the community of Garden, over which I had gotten hate mail from when they put it in. I never tell you the mail I get about any of you. You, you won't believe it. Now, don't everybody say out there, is it I? Is it I, O Bishop? No, it's not. Don't worry about this. But what I'm saying is, you know, it's just that. And then the networking space, and I thought to myself, my gosh, this place is young. Everything's happening here. I finally said to Mitchell Boone, I put my arm around him and said, Mitchell, I was wrong. Mitchell made me feel better. He said, Bishop, you do not know how many nights I stayed awake worrying if this could happen. And what I'm saying to you is that we have to take bold risk and they will fail but they will produce fruit at times. And that one kind of church doesn't suit all kinds of people. And so our ministry is so diverse in the North Texas Conference but it doesn't happen diversity in one church. It's the diversity of the whole conference that happens. And you cannot mimic or imitate what's happening somewhere else and thinking that it will be authentic but you have to know that you do create the kind of bold ministry that can happen in such a place that will prove to bear fruit and to welcome others. So Path 1 interns are a way in which we begin to use uh, the work of the General Board of Discipleship and our own work in planting seeds. So we've had a number of Path 1 interns in the last couple of years. Patrick Littlefield has been with Union Coffee Shop learning how to perhaps be the church to those who are much younger. He's going to a church that wants to be younger And we're hoping that the seeds that were planted and that investment will bear fruit. Juan Carlos from Monterrey has been a Path 1 intern with Casa Linda and David Rangel. And so this summer then, Casa Linda will will birth the first, second site plant of a Hispanic church, of a United Methodist church in the nation. It's a way in... Bryant Phelps, who's been serving as an SBC 21 internship, strengthening the black church of the 21st century at St. Paul, will be a Path 1 intern at Grace Avenue as we begin to explore ways in which to uh, have a church, be the church for the African American community in northern Collin County. It's just about planting, planting seeds and knowing that some of them will sprout and some of them will not. But it's about taking risk if we're going to be effective. And lastly, cathedrals were designed to tell stories. I like like to walk into a a, a building, a cathedral with this great stained glass and look and try to figure out what some of those pictures are and what they represent. Uh, I served a church that had this abstract stained glass window and I thought it was one of the most unique things, but like, what for? (laughs) I mean, I literally go, what's this about? 
And, and what I did was is that uh, I finally learned the story, and it was the story from chaos to creation to the Ten Commandments to the resurrection to the birth of the church, which is a, had the symbol of that church in it, to the new creation, all done with movement and color. It turned out that what we began to do is began to teach each confirmand the story of the Christian faith by using these abstract windows. And time and again, I'd see a sixth grader bring his grandparents in after confirmation Sunday and say, let me tell you the story of the church. You see, the way in which we teach people, teach young people, and teach ourselves is we tell stories. Stories. Not only the faith, but of our ministry. So a number of Saturdays ago, I had gone to the post office in Plano where we live at, at Coit and Parker. And as I was leaving, I stopped by the house on the corner. Now, the house on the corner is built by the Christ Jedi Methodist Church every summer, and it's built on the corner. It's, sort of the, it's one of the big talking points in Plano, Texas. And uh, so I decided to stop in, take a couple of pictures, and talk to a few people. And I need to tell you I was not dressed then like I am today. I was real incognito. <laughs> I hadn't shaved. I don't know if I'd, I'd... I think I'd comb my hair... I'd gone, I mean, I was just going to the post office. I, I, just, I was just going to make sure I didn't see my picture on the wall, you know, something like that. But, so I went to mail something, and uh, I said, I'm going to stop by the house on the corner and take a couple of pictures. And then I began to meet people, and they were telling me what happened. And they said, now, are you a member here? And I said, well, no, not really. <laughs> well, we want to invite you to our church. I said, well, I've been here a few times. Well, why don't you come back? I said, I will. <laughs> and then I said, uh, well, I'm the bishop of the North Texas Conference. I knew you looked familiar. <laughs> that sort of scared me a little bit the way I was dressed and looking. I knew you looked familiar. And then someone introduced herself to me. And she began to tell me that she was Kim Rankin Meyer's mother. And I said, I knew you looked familiar. <laughs> but then the reason why this story is important is because of a larger story. You see, in order for things to really happen in terms of transformation, we all have to have strategies. It's not just about doing something good one day. It's about moving with strategic purpose and passion. Knowing not necessarily what will come next, but be willing to know that you can be moved to something significant. And so what started with House on the Corner then for Christ Church Plano, and it's happened in other churches, but this one I just want to, to share with you briefly is a, a program about Project Hope, of which I've been familiar and acquainted with for a number of years because it's about the same time that the church I was pastoring did something similar. Project Hope is a program that transforms lives of its adults, participants, and their families by gaining training and education, and the pro program focuses on family, faith, education, career, budget, health, and personal issues. And so the journey begins when the family signs a contract. Now there are several other pieces to their whole initiative related to persons who are living in poverty and underserved persons and it involves a school on Sunday for students who are enrolled in a, in a project that's called Project Next Generation which helps focus on children and students um, ages 4 to 18 in each of the families in Project Hope. Uh, the school on Sunday is a way to continue to tutor people and they uh, volunteers make commitments and they do this on Sunday and it becomes a way in which they are heavily invested in the life of these families. There are other ministries of this program, other clubs, summer camps, and things of that nature. But I want to tell you a story. The first story, the story is really about a family who was selected to receive the first house on the corner. They are completing their 13th. And this is the story of a, young, of, a, of a young man. And he said, I remember coming to the church to help build the house in the parking lot. I was only six when my mom, brother, and I first moved into our new home in the Douglas community. It was a fresh start for our family. We met again when I was struck by a car at the age of eight and later when I was hit by a train at age 11. Despite their careful watch, growing up was not easy. 
After years of hanging out with the wrong crowd and on the verge of going to juvenile detention, I knew that it was time to stop being the kid that was always getting into trouble. I started playing football and made new friends in hopes to change my ways. I looked to my Project Hope family of 15 years earlier, I mean, but 10 years earlier, for guidance. That's where I met my mentor, Chris Matthews. Every Friday, Friday for the past five years, Chris has come to my school to eat lunch with me. Talk about my life and steer me in the right direction. When I started making some bad decisions again, Chris and Missy Wilkinson enrolled me in school on Sunday. That's where I met my tutor, Ann Tomaselli. I felt that God had brought these amazing people. I love the reference to God. I felt God brought these amazing people to my life to bring me the hope to show me there were people who care for me and encouraged to keep buying this complicated world through the good and the bad. I have met my angels firsthand. Thanks to my help, thanks to the help of my Christ and I met this church family, I will walk across the graduation stage with my high school diploma this June and plan to attend college in the fall. I do not know how I got to this point in my life. Well, I do. It began the moment this church gave my family a home 13 years ago. And I will always be grateful for the help and support that my family and I have been given by this church. I don't know how to show this gratitude, but I know I won't let these people down. Friends, we can do this. This is hard. It's really hard to do that which transforms our communities and people's lives. But let's start doing the deep work. Let's begin anew. Let's be willing for old models to die so that new life can come about. Let's be most tied to our mission and least tied to our models. Let's be tied to the mission of Christ and not to the models of things that were good in the 1950s or, if we're lucky, the 60s. Let's go deeper, but let's also go broader. Let us begin to understand that somehow God wants to, us to meet people who are very different than we are and live in community with them. And let us begin to understand that hopefully somebody could come behind us because not of the buildings we left, but because of the buildings, but because of the things that we did out of those buildings. That an impossible will walk through and say, I see. I see they were very religious people. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The creator of the universe says to us, do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from all and declare it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? There is no other rock. I know not one. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we gather to remember whose we are, as signified in our baptism. Through the sacrament of baptism, God's Spirit has been poured out upon water. Water that flows freely for all who will receive it. Water that brings hope to all who thirst for righteousness. Water that refreshes life, nurtures growth, and offers new birth. So today we come to the waters to renew our commitment to Christ who has raised us, the Spirit who has birthed us, and the Creator who is making all things new. 
And so I ask you, you please stand as you're able. And so I ask you, will you turn away from the powers of sin and death? Will you let the Spirit use you as prophets to the powers that be? Will you proclaim the good news and live as disciples of Jesus Christ, His body on earth? Will you be living witnesses to the gospel, individually and together, whatever you are, and in all that you do? Will you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? The Spirit of the Lord is with us. Let us pray. Almighty God, the life you birthed in us by baptism into Jesus Christ will never die. Your justice never fails. Your mercy is everlasting. Your healing river flows. Your spirit blows where you will. But sometimes we try. We try to block the flow. We redirect the winds of the spirit. Or we walk so far away from the life-giving stream that we do not hear its sound and we forget its power. We parch ourselves. We are dry. Come upon us, Holy Spirit. Come up on these waters. Let these waters be to us drops of your mercy. Let these waters renew in us the resurrection power of Jesus. Most holy God, Abba, Father, glory. Jesus Christ, Savior, Lord. Lord Spirit of fire, Spirit over the waters, Spirit of holiness. Lord Eternal God, one in three and three in one. All glory is yours now and forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. We now invite the commissioned ministers to come forth at this time. The ushers will direct you to the stations for the renewal of baptism. Remember your baptism and be thankful.
down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on. Come on, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down, come on, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down, let's go down. Come on down, come on, fathers, let's go down, down to the As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down, let's go down to come on down. Come on, mothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down, come on, sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. Come, let us use the grace divine and all with one accord in a perpetual covenant join ourselves to Christ our Lord. Give up ourselves through Jesus' power, his name to glory. And promise in this sacred hour for God to live and die. The covenant we this moment make be ever kept in mind. We will no more our God forsake or cast these words. Ah. Uh -huh. 
sculpting me, in sculpting me. God renew us, God. 
how deep your holy wisdom unimagined all your ways to your name be glory honor with our lives we worship praise we your Water washed and spirit born. By your grace, our lives we offer. Recreate us, God transform. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. You may be seated. I call upon Clayton Oliphant, who's the chair of the Episcopacy Committee, uh, to come and make their report. Members of the Episcopacy Committee are joining me at this time, I think. Yes, they are. And we are delighted to have them here. Last July, at the jurisdictional conference, um, transition time for bishops, the Jurisdictional Episcopacy Committee. The Jurisdictional Episcopacy Committee, um, in their wisdom, reappointed Bishop Mike McKee for a second quadrennium as Bishop of the Dallas area of the North Texas Conference. The best part of that deal is that we get Joan McKee. <laughs> who attended one of the finest institutions of higher learning in, in the country, Austin College. <laughs> and we are delighted to have them as our Episcopal family. We pray for them. The Committee on Episcopacy is really a uh, uh, a prayerful group that prays for our Episcopal family and um, tries to encourage and support them. We know that you join us in praying for our leaders, in praying for our bishop and for Joan. Um, what an incredible gift they are to us. Joan's work with Project Transformation is particularly inspiring to all of us and uh, we have a gift um, in their honor that we have made to Project Transformation and a gift that we hope will enable them to spend a little time with their grandchildren as well. We welcome you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to take a moment to say last night there was a sea of green in the room and that was 104, 24 college students coming here to serve on Project Transformation. And underneath those green t-shirts there are students with diverse backgrounds. It's a very diverse group. Uh, some are coming from rural areas. We have suburban and inner city represented. 16 grew up in the program. They are racially diverse. They are economically diverse, gender diverse. It's a great group. They, are, they have spent the first couple of weeks coming together, learning to navigate each other, becoming immersed so that they can go out and serve the community. And when this summer's over, they will go out and serve the world. You took the North Texas Conference, took an idea, and you embraced it and you grew it and you understood that this was the church going forward. I thank you for this gift, and I thank you for your support for Project Transformation and for every program in the conference that works with children and with youth and college students. Thank you.
Do you join me in expressing our support for Bishop McKee and Joan McKee? Thank you so much. So a couple of introductions. The first is that we have, the first is that we have a, a special guest and, and uh, with us today, uh, the former Bishop of Bolivia, of the Methodist Church in Bolivia, Bishop uh, Eugenio Poma. Uh, Bishop Poma, where are you that we may greet you? Bishop Poma? There you are. Welcome. It's also my pleasure to introduce um, someone who's known by, by some of you uh, as he was the resident bishop of the Dallas area for eight years from 1996 to 2004. Uh, Bill Oden is, uh, a, and Marilyn Oden are dear friends of Joan and mine, and we are always delighted when they're in the area. Uh, the Odens were here for the Council of Bishops meeting earlier in May. Uh, he is here today with us. Uh, I'll, I'll make a couple of statements about that, but Bishop Oden, uh, I'm glad that you've come home to the place where you, you, you uh, belong, and so uh, I'm always glad when an Oklahoman sees best to come to Texas. So, uh, <laughs> so Bishop Oden, I think you want to address the conference about uh, some work that he's done uh, related to uh, his life and ministry, and uh, it's something that's going to be made available to you, and I'm going to encourage you uh, to purchase one as well. I have read it. So, Bishop Oden. Thank you, Bishop McKee. I am pleased to be here and appreciate the gracious hospitality of your bishop. Uh, John Wesley was known as an evangelist, a preacher, uh, and an organizer, but he was also a bookseller. Every place he went, he had a bag of books to sell that continued in America with Asbury and bishops since uh, Bishop McKendry and Soul have written their biography, autobiographies, their memoirs, and uh, have delivered them to the church. I'm sure that mine will be on the New York Times bestseller list. I appreciate very much uh, the memoirs that I've read of bishops, and especially like Bishop Gerald Kennedy's uh, While I'm on My Feet. He tells about the time when the uh, Indian Mission Conference addressed the Council of Bishops, and when finished, uh, the uh, presiding bishop, Frank Smith, said uh, uh, how much he enjoyed presiding over the Indian Conference and announced that they gave him a headdress uh, when he retired. His brother, Angie Smith, jumped up from the back and said, Frank, why is it they gave you just a headdress and they gave me a beautiful silver tool saddle. And Frank just immediately responded and said, well, Angie, the, the Indians have a tradition of honoring the part of the human body used the most. <laughs> I had the privilege of serving the Louisiana Conference for eight years the uh, most unique conference in Methodism, and then the North Texas Conference, the greatest conference in Methodism. Yeah. And then after uh, four years as Bishop in Residence at Perkins, an ecumenical officer, we retired to Santa Fe, and from there to the uh, Windcrest Retirement Center in Denver. It's really a joy to be here. I appreciate uh, your bishop's hospitality. Uh, I'll be leaving at noon to fly back to Denver, where Marilyn and I will leave in the morning to an Alaska, for an Alaskan cruise celebrating our 60th wedding anniversary. Um, we, uh, we've never been on a cruise, and I'm uh, very fearful of the ship sinking or me getting seasick but we're going to try it anyway. And again, uh, I want to thank uh, Bishop McKee for his beautiful hospitality and Joelle for her help. Uh, and we're leaving right after lunch, and 
uh, Bi uh, Clayton Oliphant and Mary Brooke will be uh, at my table selling books to anyone who wants to drop by after lunch. Thank you again, and it's really a joy being with you. Glad you're here. So at break time, which will come a little bit later, Bishop Odin will be selling his memoirs, and uh, I, have, I have read it, and so I encourage you, I really do encourage you to buy one. I think it's helpful for you to know something not only about his life, but the life of the North Texas Conference during a period of time that is important. When I begin to think about role models in the Council of Bishops of, uh, of, of the last quarter of a century and persons who really did understand the nature and the work of the church at appropriate times, uh, Bishop Bill Odin, without any doubt, is a leader. Uh, the leader of the United Methodist Church, he failed to tell you that he also serves the president of the Council of Bishops. Uh, frankly, I think that's the hardest job I know in the church. I mean, uh, I mean, think about presiding over a group of, uh, of people who really all want to be leaders. I mean, and just function that way all the time. It's, uh, herding cats is child's play compared to that. I want you to know that. So, but and we appreciate you, Bill and Marilyn Oden, for being here. And again, he'll be at the table uh, signing his books, and I encourage you to get one. I believe now we're going to move to the time for the Board of Ordained Ministry report. And so, Reverend Tim Morrison and all who are reporting can come and sit in the chancel or in the choir loft. And so, we'll move through that report. And so, be attentive. There's some uh, uh, special presentations that'll be made at this time. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, Bishop and members of the North Texas Conference. My name is Tim Morrison, and it is my privilege to lead you in the Board of Ministry report this morning. I would like for um, not just these folks, but anybody who is a member of the Board of Ministry of North Texas to come and stand over here alongside with us right here. Go ahead and come with your seats. And while they were coming, I would like to invite anyone who serves on a district committee, wherever you are, would you stand up right where you are, right in your spot? We'll have the board come up here. DCOMs, please stand. I would just to acknowledge um, your presence and give a hearty statement of gratitude and thanks. And for everyone else in the room. These people that you see standing up need your constant prayer and support. Continue to pray for them that the Holy Spirit will continue to anoint them with grace and the power of discernment in this ultimately really significant and wonderful part of our conference. At this time, I would like to begin our report with Marsha Middleton, who will um, lead us in local pastor. My name is Marsha Middleton. I'm the director of local pastors education, and I come to you today to acknowledge three groups of people. The first are those who have completed licensing school on Friday, May 26th. We just finished. And um, we, if you, that is you, please make your way to the front and I will um, read your name and you'll be greeted by our chair of local pastors. And uh, we want to include Jeff Cullen, Ryan Elms, Ash Harmon, Lonnie Hawkins, Sandy Hurd, Norman Madawa, Nick McRae, Griselda Montalban, Lynn Phillips, Ed Price, Carlos Ramirez, and Jesse Sanchez. These folks uh, are going to be serving us, some of them full-time, some part-time, and we appreciate what they do and what they will be doing as they serve in the life of the church. It's really important work. Thank you so much. If you have graduated from course of study school this year, please make your way up. You'll be the next group. And our thanks to all of you today. Want to acknowledge, um, yes, amen. Of course, 
Intensive Study School is the um, school, uh, the alternative education wrap for persons in our denomination that are not uh, going to seminary for a wide variety of reasons. It is not because it's easy. It is not. And it's not because it's short. It is not. It takes a minimum of five years to complete and um, up to 10 if you go part-time. And um, that's often extended to 12, which is our statute of limitations. So we have persons who have served a long time. We're going to be recognizing them today. We have Al Easterling, Paul Mayenberg, Luella Williams, Luella is presiding at a funeral today. We have Robert Williams, and we have Bill Lewis, who I believe has finished his work as well. I haven't seen him this morning. There you are. You want to come up and get your goodie? And we may have more. And if that is the case, let us know. But we want you to recognize all of these who have gone to school a long time to serve you. And they do so for very little remuneration. Um, they work really hard. They go to places in the conference that not just everybody will go, to be perfectly honest. And we're grateful for them. Thank you all so much. Now, if you have finished ever a course of study, basic course of study, if you are a graduate of basic course of study, please stand where you are and let's recognize you. Thank you so much, and you may return to your seats, folks, and I want to um, welcome Reverend Billy Eccles Richter. Thank you, Marcia. Yesterday at the clergy session, we had the privilege of uh, voting into membership candidates for associate membership, provisional membership, and full membership. We have the joy this morning of introducing them to you here at annual conference. We're going to begin with the associate member that uh, we received yesterday and then the provisional members, as I call your name, if you will please come to the front. The person that we are receiving this year into associate membership is Peter McNabb. And then we have 10 provisional deacons that we elected yesterday. Kay Ash, Michael Flynn, Tammy Galloway, Margaret Jenkins, Paviel Jenkins, Evan Jones, Kathy Nations, Allison Schulman, Kathy Sweeney, Emma Williams. And then we elected into provisional membership 12 provisional elders, and I'll invite them to come forward as well. Roy Atwood, George Battle III, Chuck Church, Jimmy Decker, Ricky Harrison, Allison Jean, Stephen Lohoffer, Christopher O'Reilly, David Rangel, Chris Rickwartz, Courtney Schultz, and Taylor Smith. to provisional membership.
Bishop, yesterday we also had the privilege of receiving a person who comes to us uh, in recognition of her orders from another Christian denomination, and that person is Martha Valencia. And then we have persons that we are uh, uh, thrilled to introduce to you today as being received into full membership, uh, and they will be ordained this evening. Uh, Phil Dickey, Maria Dixon Hall, and Ben Hensley. They are elected into full membership and will be ordained tonight as deacons. And then there are those who were elected into full membership who will be ordained tonight as elders. Rick Davis, Jonathan Grace, Donnie Haywood, Amy Spore, Pam White, and Alex Williams. And then there are two other persons that fit into this category tonight. One of them uh, has been ordained, was recognized uh, with his orders from another denomination two years ago. He's been through our residency program, and yesterday he was elected into full membership of the annual conference, and that's Jonathan Perry. And then we have another person who's been a full member of our annual conference for several years, uh, but she is switching her orders uh, from deacon to elder, and so tonight she will be ordained as an elder, and that is Rachel Bachman. Bishop, we welcome these, uh, and we look forward and to the celebration that will be held tonight. Uh, we end up with 10 who are being ordained and 22 who are being commissioned this evening. It should be quite an event. Thank you. Even as we'd welcome those who are entering on the journey, we'd want to honor those who have run the race and have kept the faith. And so we want to take some time now to, to recognize and to give thanks to our retirees. I want to share with you that as we welcome them forward that their accumulated years of service are 650. And just to think about what that means in terms of the life of our conference. Uh, they've carried forward the work of Jesus Christ in, I think, just about every capacity in our conference. They have touched all of our lives. I know that we are here in, in so many ways and have blessed the lives of so many people. They have guided the life of the church. They've strengthened their communities. And, and as a conference, they have given their lives to enrich our life as a conference. And we know these who are going to be coming forward as pastors and as leaders and as friends. And even as they've answered the historic questions and accepted the authority from the bishop, they've run the race and they've kept the faith. They have blessed us in their giving of their lives for the proclamation of the gospel. So on the retirement as they come, we express our deepest gratitude and our heartfelt prayers as they move forward in what's ahead for each of them. So I'm going to invite the retirees uh, to come forward at this time uh, with their spouses, if that's applicable and they're attending. And so we'd welcome you to come forward uh, in these moments. Bill Bryan, Alice Coder, 
Nancy DiStefano, Larry George, Paul Goodrich, Sarah Hardaway, Ken Hildebrand, Anna Hoseman Butler, Barbara Markham, Mike Nichols, Jim Osher, Diane Presley, Larry Tinsley, Preston Weaver, David Weber, Pat Whitmore, Gene Wisdom, Clay Womack, and Larry Davis. Again, as these come before us, I'd invite us to give our expressions of gratitude. So before these return to their seats, uh, I want to say a special word of appreciation. Uh, Paul Goodrich did share with me, and I'm just, Paul, I'm going to go ahead and share this now, because if I don't tell somebody, then I'll forget it. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, Paul Goodrich said after a few months, then he'll, he'll do interim pastor for, in the North Texas Conference. So I just oh. wanted to get that on the public record. He was serious about it, though, so I want, I want to thank that, because that, that is important ministry of our annual conference. I want to say thank you to all of you for your service. And so many of you I've known in different ways through the years, and uh, I, I want to pray God's blessings upon you, and thank you again for your service. So may we pray together. Holy and gracious God, 600-plus years of ministry are represented in the lives of these who are before us. Ministry to to thousands upon thousands of people. Hundreds or thousands of sermons preached, hospital visits made, counseling sessions, but just representing you. And so for this endless line of splendor, we give you thanks. And may their years ahead be fruitful and good ones for them 
and for others they continue to touch, even as retired clergy, because we're all still ministers of the gospel. God's blessings upon all of them. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we have a little bit more of the retirement to do, and we, we're going to do that now. So, Paul? I would also want to, to invite us to recognize and to appreciate and to celebrate our deacons, uh, Terry Jones and Paul McKay. I would invite them also to come forward at this time and that we might give them a thanks as they retire as well. So Terry Jones. So I want to thank Terry for his service as well and to remind you that the work in the Order of Deacons is important in the life of our church because it connects the church with the world in, some, in unique ways. And one of my first experiences with Terry as the Bishop of North Texas Conference happened at an interfaith service uh, that at Highland Park, uh, or I should, uh, uh, in a religious service I really should say, uh, in terms of that experience. And so I want to thank him not only for his work in the local church, but his outstanding work in terms of some interfaith and interreligious work that it was a passion for him and continues to be so. So I want to thank you, Terry, for that. So let me uh, pray a prayer of blessing for Terry's ministry and his retirement as well. Holy God, we give you thanks for Terry and his work among us that continues even after retirement. We're grateful for the ways in which he has moved not only through congregations but with other people, people of different faiths, different traditions, and help them to see that those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus and are known as that are truly known for the values and the core of who Jesus the Christ was and continues to be in all of our lives. For Terry's ministry and how he represented you, we are indeed, all, we are indeed very grateful. For I pray this prayer on your behalf in the name of the Christ. Amen. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, Terry. Bishop, as we continue with the report this morning, I wanted to let everyone know that the videos for both the ordinance and the retirees will be playing throughout the extent of conference, and you'll be seeing those throughout as the days progress. Next, I have invited uh, Matt Tuggle and Blair Thompson White to come and address you this morning, because as part of the Board of Ordained Ministry, we have a new residency program, one that many of you may not be familiar with, but we are incredibly excited about possibilities and new things that are happening for the future. Blair, Matt? Good morning, Bishop. Annual conference. It was two years ago this month that the bishop invited the two of us to lunch at Seasons 52. And Blair and I didn't know what he was up to, but we figured he was up to something. Yes, sir. Don't tell him I spent that much money. They may expect it. I paid for it. I paid for it. No, you, you didn't. didn't. No, I paid for it. He paid for it. And, you know, we're sure what he's going to ask us to do, but we knew he was going to ask us to do something. And what he asked us to do was to give leadership to our residency program Moving forward, as many of you know, the residency program is a two-year program between when deacons and elders are commissioned and, and they're eligible uh, to be ordained. It's an important piece of our ministry here in the North Texas Annual Conference because it's helping to prepare deacons and elders to continue to grow in their ministry as they minister to the parishioners of our congregation. And we want to share with you just three things this morning about the residency. First, we want to share with you some of the assumptions that we're making stepping into this new model. Second, we want to share with you uh, a little bit about the uh, philosophy behind it and some of the research that we've done. And then finally, very quickly, we want to share with you some of the key components. We spent a year researching this, and then last year we began implementing it for the first year with those deacons and elders who were commissioned at annual conference last year. So... First, here are the assumptions that Blair and I were making as we stepped into developing this new residency. First, we believe that the North Texas Annual Conference Residency Program should focus on areas of learning that are not experienced in seminary. 
We didn't want these two years to just be a recap of what residents had already learned in seminary. The second thing that we felt is that we needed to shift the onus of learning from the annual conference and the residency program to the residents. So we're saying uh, this is an opportunity for you to continue in your growth. Blair and I are going to support you in that, but the onus is really on you to continue your uh, education over the next two years. Third, our conference has marks of fruitfulness that identify what it means to be an effective minister, and we're incorporating those into the residency, and that's not what we're using to evaluate whether growth is occurring or not. Fourth is that we feel like the residency period, those two years, should be an incubator for innovative ministry, so we're encouraging red residents uh, to think outside of the box and do innovative ministry. And then finally, we felt like if we're requiring our newest clergy to participate in this, that this should be a want to and not just a have to kind of program. And we feel like this residency ought to be of such high quality that residents want to participate in it. So those are the five assumptions that we made going into this. Blair will share with you a little bit about the research that we did, what we learned, and some of the key components of our residency program. So part of our process in developing the new residency program involved contacting other residency programs and clergy leadership development programs across the country and gathering best practices. And one key learning for us was the distinction between horizontal and vertical learning. Horizontal learning has been the traditional model. It's the sit and get model, lecture style. This is not as effective as the vertical model in which learners receive information that they must then integrate into their practice of ministry. So our design of the program emphasizes vertical learning. We want to engage and equip residents with resources and tools that will directly impact their ministry. The expectation is that everything we do will feed into their Making Disciples project with an emphasis on developing projects that are creative, innovative, and truly move people into deeper levels of discipleship. Our program has three key components. First, retreats. This past year, we met for two two-and-a-half-day retreats at Prothrow Center. We aligned our guest presenters with key areas of the marks of fruitfulness. At our first retreat last fall, Dr. Andy Stoker joined us to talk about family systems and help residents work through their family and church systems. Dr. Alice McKenzie led us through a preaching workshop. Reverend Rebecca Hensley shared about the Luke 4 initiative and inspired residents to consider their missional field in their context. Reverend Brian Hardesty Crouch led and guided residents through spiritual reflection devotion, and Reverend Jody Smith offered a financial workshop focusing on clergy taxes. This past spring, we welcomed Greg Hawkins, author and former executive director of Willow Creek Church, who really pushed us to consider what it means to make disciples of Jesus Christ. One of our residents said of our retreats and her evaluation that our time in retreat together has truly been enriching for her personal discipleship, and for her ministry. And this is truly our deepest hope and prayer, that our residents will both grow to be deeper disciples and also deepen their abilities to lead faithfully in their context. The second aspect of our program is that every resident received a preaching mentor. We are so grateful for the work of Dr. Alice McKenzie and Dr. Wes Allen and the Center for Preaching Excellence, who helped to train mentors and guide this process of our program. And we are thankful for our preaching mentors who dedicated their time to working with our residents. Residents met uh, and analyzed several sermons with their preaching mentors several times this year. We have consistently heard through our resident evaluations that our preaching mentors have been critical to their growth as preachers. The third aspect of our program is our peer meetings. We met four times this past year for day-long meetings where residents brought a verbatim and a sermon to share with their peers and receive feedback. Now, these meetings have fostered deeper relationships among the residents, and we hope encouraged a culture of asking for and receiving help from colleagues that will go well beyond our residency program. Uh, one final word about our program. It is a work in progress, and we continue to evaluate, learn, and adjust as we listen and discern what is truly fruitful for our residents. And on a personal note, Matt and I uh, want to say what a privilege it is to lead in this effort. We learn so much from our residents, and we are inspired by their faithfulness and love for God and for our church. So we ask your prayers as we continue in our second year. Thank you.
Our thanks to both Matt and Blair for their creative and prayerful and inspiring leadership for the residency program. Bishop, this time, on behalf of the Board of Ministry, I move for the adoption of this report of the Board of Ministry to the North Texas Conference. Okay, th this is before you. If you will accept the report, will you raise your hand? Okay, thank you. It passes. Thank you, sir. Well, let's express a word of appreciation to the Board of Bourdain Ministry. This is difficult work. So we're going to be on a break here in a moment. As we break, one of the things I want to remind you is that we're going to come back. Um, you're going to have 12 minutes. You'll be back at uh, 1045 so that we can continue with the morning. So we're only behind about three or four minutes. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to make that up uh, as we move through this day, and we will. Am I on? Okay. So uh, the other thing uh, about that is remember that Bishop Odin will be in the Shawver Welcome Center. Am I correct about that? And he will be signing his memoirs. I encourage you to, uh, to get this book again. Uh, it'll have some good history of the North Texas Conference. Um, and then you may can at some point get in a conversation, get an even better history of the North Texas Conference. But this is a really good one. So if you'll do that. So it's 1024, 1045 we start by my watch. Oh, it's Anyway, you got 10 or 11 minutes. We have a few things to do before uh, the lunch break so as we could come back together. Let me uh, offer So as as we uh, as we gather, let me make a couple of introductions. Uh, they're really known to uh, many of us in the room. First of first of all, I want to um, uh, welcome Tom Locke, the president of Texas Methodist Foundation. Tom is in the back of the center of the room. So Tom, wave. Let's welcome Tom Locke, the president of Texas Methodist Foundation. Thank you, Tom. So. So as a reminder, the Texas Methodist Foundation uh, is providing uh, great leadership in terms of developing clergy and lay leaders, not only now uh, in the Texas and New Mexico annual conferences, but throughout the jurisdiction and also throughout the country. They become a convener of many conversations, some of which are known to us and some of which are not widely and broadly known about the future of the United Methodist Church, about its strengths, about the depth of its witness, about uh, our emerging uh, uh, the emerging church as we are going to know it soon. So we're grateful for the ways in which 
uh, TMF continues to invest in the United Methodist Church and her God-appointed missions. And so, Tom, thank you again for your leadership and what you do. We appreciate it. And thank you for being with North Texas. Tom always tells me he loves to come on Sunday night to North Texas because the worship is always rich. And he certainly was last night. So, Tom, thank you. I also saw Dean Craig Hill a few moments ago. And is Dean Hill in the Oh, there you are. So, Dean Hill, Dean at Perkins School of Theology, he's had a great year. Uh, Craig, we are so grateful for the ways in which you're leading the school, and I want to say a word of appreciation. So, let's uh, greet Dean Craig Hill as well. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to now watch retiree videos, and not all of them, but there are a few of them that we'll watch for the next few minutes. Persons you saw a few moments ago, a few minutes ago, standing here who entering into the retired relationship, you're going to see these videos now. I always find these to be rich, and there are ways in which we make them available to the retirees as well. So, let us go. Which has been somewhat of a a late comer, a late bloomer, because I didn't accept a call until I was beyond six careers. And so the Lord has used me as a change agent in many ways to go and minister to the poor, to help those who are lost, to bring to the, the fold life, renewed life. And so over these past uh, years that I've been serving, I've had the opportunity to uh, serve in the, in the urban community, at the same time serve in cross-cultural appointments where I've I had a vision that all of God's people should indeed be together as one. I'm often reminded of the Pentecost and how all of God's people came together and spoke many languages and all understood one another because of the Holy Spirit. And so my hope for this time and throughout my journey is that this will come to fruition here on earth. One of the ways that God has been creating over the course of my ministry has been in missions. Although I have long had a passion for prison ministry and ministries for the homeless, being ordained has given me ways to live into those and other mission opportunities. I've been blessed to be part of Kairos Outside, a ministry for women who have a loved one in prison or who have themselves been in prison. And then through the dedicated work of Reverend Holly Bandell and Lady Craig Jacobs, First Plano is a member of Family Promise in Collin County. And I've been privileged to spend the night on many of our rotations with these families and see both their ordinariness, any of us might be in their shoes, and also their extraordinary dedication and flexibility as they get back on their feet. We and I have been blessed through these and other outreach opportunities that enable us to see the world beyond us and attend to the needs of those who are hurting, whether physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. After graduating from seminary and doing an internship and spending three years as an associate pastor, I thought that I was really ready and knew everything there was to know about being a pastor. When I arrived in Maybank, my first pastorate, it took less than 48 hours for me to realize that I didn't know come from Sikkim. Over the next 40 years, God used countless lay people in each of the churches where I served to show me how to live as a Christian and then how also to be a caring pastor. So my advice to any of you who are beginning your ministry, watch, listen, and learn from the lay people in each of the churches you serve. After about six months of phone calls to Bill Crouch back in 1994, 95, asking him if he had a church that I could be assigned to, he told me he did. It was a church of misfits, he said. You'll fit right in. And it was that kind of church, Richland United Methodist Church, but, but gloriously so. During eight years there at what became Cornerstone, we sold two church campuses and built a new church at a third location. And for one who was most happy walking amongst the wildflower fields, now I finish in Mesquite, a community, a, a microcosm of America itself. 
undergoing rapid demographic and, and cultural change. Frustrating and, and fascinating both. Because God is in that change, just as God is in each of us. And in the spaces between us. That knowledge affects the way that I see everything and everyone. The light is in all things, all people. God's been creating in me ministry from the very beginning, sending me wonderful people, uh, laity, clergy friends, like Roger Morris, who uh, was a large German in my first church, always sat on the third row in front of the pulpit and uh, fell asleep every Sunday my first year in preaching. And I was determined, I was determined to keep him awake. And by the end of the second year, I was doing that. But other wonderful people, uh, laity, uh, clergy friends like uh, Jordan Grooms, mentors like Ted Dots, have uh, been sent by God to help shape me in the ministry that I do. And I continue with that, paying that forward as a part of the life that I live in ministry. The people of God, the people of God, um, we come in with our little bit of knowledge thinking we're going to show them the way of faith. And the truth of the matter is that they show us again and again and again. So I have seen God working repeatedly and consistently and continuously through the lives of the people that I have been blessed to call to serve. Four churches over 20 years, and God has never failed to teach me through them what uh, a life of following Christ is like. Well, when you ask about how God's been creating in me, in my ministry, I have to say, uh, God had to start with raw material. It was 51 years ago when I was a junior in high school that I began to serve my first church. And uh, then uh, over the next two or three years, I served uh, several other uh, small rural churches. And, and I was never happier in that setting. And then I moved to the big city of Dallas to go to seminary. And, and, and that's when God opened my eyes to the plight of poverty and people who lived in marginalized communities and so I had the joy of working in the what was then called the East Dallas Cooperative Parish with uh, John Thornburg and uh, Bill Bryan and others and, and it was just such a great time and then I went from there to uh, an affluent uh, growing suburb of Flower Mound and to pastor at Treach and I was there for almost 18 years and uh, then I went from there on to the conference office uh, to become a bureaucrat for Jesus and help uh, start new churches in the North Texas Conference and help with revitalization. So uh, I guess when I look back, I realize uh, uh, I didn't know what the heck I was supposed to do any place I went to do it. It just took God's creativity and, and a lot of loving lay people in the churches who helped shape me and mold me. and. Uh, and raise me up and be patient with me and, and forgive me for all the mess ups that I made as their pastor. God has been creating in my ministry even before my birth by sending a young pastor, Reverend H. Grady May, to his very first church, College Mount, in 1916. Years later, in the neighborhood I grew up in, a family invited me to go to church. They not only invited me, they took me with them, even out to eat afterwards. That family was the grandson of H. Grady May. Now, there have been other people in my ministry that have greatly affected me, like John Poe Hensley, Fred Durham, and Reverend Linwood John Robertson. He had a vision of 12 youth who would be the uh, called into the ministry. I was one of the first of those 12. Later on, it was Dr. Gordon Cassad of Walnut Hill United Methodist Church who put me back on the road of licensed ministry. I'm ending my ministry with that same church that H. Grady May began his ministry, College Mount United Methodist Church. After 29 years, I indeed believe God has called me into such a great ministry of touching people's lives and their touching mine in so many ways. It's a very odd thing to find oneself standing at that strange place where active ministry meets the retired relationship. So now as I look back at the diversity of the settings and the unique challenges and opportunities of those places to which I have been appointed and those communities to which my family has lovingly gone, 
I can only praise God with a heart of deep gratitude and with a profound hope that I have not only heard but also tried faithfully to live into my understanding of ministry as loving God by loving others in God's name, as doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. God's presence with me and gifts to me have changed my life in ways beyond my ability to name or number. But I do know that the change has been transformative. As a kid from a small town on the western edge of the conference, has now spent his entire adult life, 47 years, under appointment by the North Texas Conference to places we once called foreign, but learned to love as home. To settings in all four districts of the annual conference, and even on the conference staff and in the Episcopal office. So to the question then of how God has been creating in me over the course of my ministry, I think I simply want to say that God has been creating in me a wideness for God's mercy, and that in whatever small ways, I have been privileged to share that good news with others. In my ministry, I have learned several things. I need to say I am learning several things because you never quit learning. Um, hopefully you never quit learning. But God has been teaching me that, that whenever something really seems to be a tragic thing happening, something uh, unexpected and looks like it's going to be just a complete disaster, don't panic. Just, just wait and start looking because something wonderful is about to happen. And God's going to do the most amazing kind of things. And there's going to be transformation in the situation and in me. This is a, um, it's, it's a wonderful lesson that uh, is, it applies everywhere in every part of your life and every part of your ministry. Because God is the one that does the transformation. Well, God used some very lonely decision points. When I had to decide which way to go, so often I'd be in prayer and God would be nowhere nearby. And I found if I took the world-denying path, God would meet me around the corner and lead me into great life and great ministry. So I found out that God was creating me by a call that was a yes after a yes after a yes. And that still continues. One of the biggest yeses was in 1983 because of reading Luke's Gospel and Sojourner's Magazine, and also wanting to be an urban person and realizing that being an easy middle-class person in America was not the gospel life for me. I asked for an inner city church, and the district superintendent said he could still hear my feet on the stairs when that appointment was made. I didn't even make it to my car. That was a big change. And through all of this creating of God, an active God, in my call and ministry. I've been trying to answer the question we ask all those interns at the end of their evaluation. What is your theology of ministry? I had to make up a word to make mine. As a minister, I'm the story keeper. I don't live the strongest discipleship story, but I'm near the lay people who do. In the theological education, which belongs not to me, but to the church, helps me polish their story of faith and then link it to the old, old story, especially in communion. So I'm a story keeper. My ministry has been uh, a journey of self-discovery, uh, some of that through introspection, some of it in connection with others, and uh, most of it in the context of work in the local church. I've come to know myself better, uh, what my gifts and graces are, and have grown in my relationship with God. And for me, that is all a part of growing into the new creation uh, God is creating within me uh, and leading me toward. A certain and much utilized prayer of confession um, in, in our worship around these parts uh, when taken out of confessional language and used for in, in positive, more positive language would say something like this. Uh, let us love and let us love and do our God's will. Let us, let us receive and live out of our Christ's law of grace and, 
And let us, let us hear and respond to the cry of the needy. And I think expressed like that, that sets the stage for any consideration I do about what, how God over these years has, has been creating new things in me, kingdom things in me. And I think the word or the idea I would use is that um, God's great work, I think, in that in my life and in, in ministry has been uh, becoming more and more a builder of bridges and less and less uh, an erector of walls. A year and a half ago at the Council of Bishops meeting in Junaluska in November of 2015, Greg Jones was the presenter for us in our learning retreat. It was not an open council meeting, it was not officially a meeting, it was a meeting of the active bishops, residential bishops, in which we did lear we'd do learning together once a year. And in that meeting he talked about Christian social innovation. Uh, the book is available, I believe, at the bookstore. I thought those three presentations for the council are probably the best things that have happened since I've been on the Council of Bishops because we began to expand our minds, at least mine, in terms of the way in which the church could be, the way in which we have to innovate or I would think die, the way in which we have to learn to embrace new things, but it was so biblically grounded, I remained just totally engaged, which, is, which I must tell you is difficult for me, but Greg, I want to tell you that I was totally engaged. And so I'm grateful that Greg Jones, who you can read his biography in the, uh, in the, the guide for the annual conference, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a biography that includes a lot of information and things that Greg Jones has done. But I'm glad that he has come to be with us because I think his three presentations for us will be informative for us and enlightening, and I think will strengthen our faith and our witness, most importantly, strengthen our witness. So will you join me in welcoming Greg Jones to the North Texas Conference? Thank you, Bishop McKee. It's a great joy to be with you here and to be able to share in this time of annual conference and back in uh, the Dallas area. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, to send your spirit upon us gathered here, speak through me, if necessary, in spite of me, and always beyond me, that your word might be heard by your people this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Back in the early days of airplane travel, there was a plane that was flying from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles. Back in those days, it took even longer than it does now. The plane was flying over the Rockies, and it had descended into a very heavy fog. And in the midst of that fog, as it kept flying and kept flying, the pilot finally came over the loudspeaker, and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I have good news and bad news. First, the bad news. We're lost. Now, the good news. We're two hours ahead of schedule. <laughs> I want to suggest to you that's not a bad description of us in the United States these days, in the broader world, in the church, and especially the United Methodist Church. We're lost, but we're moving at a more rapid pace than ever before. We used to put instant coffee into a microwave and get impatient at how long it takes. It used to be called keeping up with the Joneses, but I'm a Jones and even I can't keep up. We're moving at warp speed in every direction on social media and in technology and in all sorts of ways. And yet, in many senses, we're lost. We're not quite sure where we're going or why or what's at stake. We've gotten confused. We're looking inward and fighting with each other. And we're doing it rapidly. In the broader context, even before the travails of the last several months and divisions, you had authors like Niall Ferguson writing a book called The Great Degeneration two years ago. The subtitle is, How Institutions Decay and Economies Die. He's not looking at the church, he's looking at the broader secular environment, and he takes up fields like economics and politics and education and civil society. And the law. 
And he sees what he says in Western culture, meaning Western Europe and the United States. He said, a great degeneration. And it worried him deeply. Last year, Yuval Levine wrote a book called The Fractured Republic, in which his argument was not that we just have disagreements where you have two sides. He said, actually, we have a fracturing that's causing multiple forms of division. And they're just talking about Western culture or American culture. They're not even looking at the church or the United Methodist Church. This sense that there's lots of things happening. And as Yeats might have put it, or indeed did put it in a poem a century ago, we're finding that the center doesn't hold. And so in the midst of all of this, we're moving at rapid paces and we're making changes and shifts all the while that we're finding ourselves lost. And so in the midst of that, there's all kinds of new strategies and, and fix-it programs and restructuring and all kinds of things that organizations, including the church, do as if we could fix it with techniques rather than a reorientation to fundamental questions rather than getting clear about where we're headed and why. Sometimes we say what we really need is better leaders. Ever hear that in a local church or in the conference? If we could just get better leaders, everything would be fine. But really, there are deeper questions for us at stake. And so I want to spend some time with you this morning taking us back to a book. Now, I want to warn you, it's most of your favorite book of the Bible, and so it may be old news to you all. But I want to take us to that book called Numbers. <laughs> now, in the Jewish tradition, that book has typically been called In the Wilderness. And if that was the title of the book, it might be your favorite book of the Bible. Because you see, when you see the book named Numbers, it usually gives us all a little PTSD about that time in school when we decided math was not for me. Whether that was algebra or geometry or calculus or somewhere... But we get these shivers down our spine when we hear the word numbers. But the book's more aptly called In the Wilderness because the larger horizon of the book is about Israel's struggles in the wilderness. In the Christian tradition, the name numbers, as you know, comes from the two censuses that are taken in, in the book. And so it's focused on those two censuses and the role they play in the book. But I want to focus on that sense of being in the wilderness and the chapters between Numbers 10 and number 20, Numbers 21, which as David Stubbs shows in his commentary on Numbers, forms a chiasm. That tradition in literature where you have pairs of stories that then work toward a central point. In chapter 10 and chapter 21 of Numbers, you have the Israelites in the wilderness and they're whining. But it's just generalized whining and complaining. Are we there yet? Dad, why is it taking so long? It's just generic moaning. The kind of thing you find in ordinary life in a church. Nothing too significant, just kind of generic whining. Call that D and D prime. And then as you get a little closer toward the heart of the story, at C and C prime, the whining gets more significant. Now it's focused on the stuff of life. We don't have food. We don't have bread. We don't have water. So now we've gone from generic whining to whining about what really matters. We're going to starve. We don't have the things that are necessary to sustain human bodies. So the complaints have gotten more serious. That's C and C prime. And then as you get closer to the story in chapters 12 and chapters 16 and 17, you have complaints about leadership. In, Roman, in, in Numbers 12, it's a complaint from Miriam and Aaron about Moses. How come he gets to be the leader? What about us? Interestingly, what we learn is the narrator says, Moses is the one because he's more humble than you are. Now, anybody who's been reading along in Scripture has got to pause and go, Moses? Humility? Have you read Exodus, God? But the point there is that the humility that's being referred to is about an intimacy with God. You see, the point is not whether or not 
Moses is a forceful leader. But it's about a relationship with God. You see, we, what we ta- often take as humility is more like the kind of passive-aggressive behavior that often undermines true leadership. There's a great scene in a Christian century cartoon of a little man standing before St. Peter at a very big desk, and St. Peter has the dossier out, and the pearly gates are right behind him, and St. Peter looks down at the little man, and he says, your application says meek and humble, but your dossier says passive-aggressive. <laughs> Intimacy with God. See, the closer you are to God, the more aware you become that you're not God. And so humility, the authentic humility, is not a false humility or a sense of humiliation. It's a recognition that no matter what gifts or talents you've been given, you're still small in relation to who God is. And so the more intimate you become with God, the more humble you are. Unfortunately, in the contemporary church, too much of the noise comes from the shallow end of the pool. Not from people who are intimate with God and have that deep intimacy and thus humility who are being raised up for leadership, but rather the people who say, look at me, and by the way, God's somewhere in the background. And so when Miriam and Aaron complain about leadership, the response is, get more intimate with God, and then you might be equipped for leadership. In number 16... And 17, you have where the complaints about leadership get really serious and violence ensues and more than 200 people die in the revolt of Korah and the rebellion. So you have the complaints from Miriam and Aaron on the one hand and the rebellion that leads to 250 deaths and you're at B and B prime. But the problems of leadership aren't yet the real heart of the problem facing the Israelites. That comes in the chapters 13 and 14, which is the heart of the chiasm, the heart of the whole story of numbers. It's the story of Moses sending out the 12 spies. Moses sends out 12 spies to go out and spy out the promised land. They're the first Methodists in the Bible because they come back and they have a majority report and a minority report. (laughs) The majority report comes from 10 of the spies And they say, we've looked up ahead and we better not go there. There are giants up ahead. They look so enormous. We are like grasshoppers. There's no way we can go forward. The obstacles, they are enormous. We can't even risk any of that. We had better go back to Egypt. The minority report comes from Joshua and Caleb. And they come back and they say, we've spied out the promised land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And we trust that if God is calling us to that promised land, God will help us navigate the obstacles and so we can go forward trusting God for the future. Well, you know the story. The Israelites adopt the majority report and they start chanting, let's go back to Egypt. Egypt was suffering. Egypt was slavery. Egypt was oppression. Egypt was familiar. How often, how often we as human beings get used to what's familiar, even when we know it's killing us. And so the Israelites unite up and they say, let's go back to Egypt. My father, who was a Methodist minister, said every church he ever served had a back to Egypt committee in it. But the truth of the matter is, every one of us, when we're honest with ourselves, would acknowledge we have a back to Egypt part of our souls. We see what God is doing, we see where God is calling us, and we know that that's where we ought to be going, and then we think, yeah, but this is familiar. We get anxious, and we'd rather get stuck. Or go back to what causes misery for us and for others. We get stuck in what Augustine called the chains and habits of sin and brokenness rather than trusting God for the future. It's only when we with Joshua and Caleb remember that if God is the source of the future that we can trust God to navigate us through any and all obstacles that we might encounter. That there is a land flowing with milk and honey. And so the story of that book called In the Wilderness is fundamentally a story 
about giving up that whining, even if it's about bread and water. It's about thinking that somehow if we just get the right kinds of techniques of leadership into place, it's about rediscovering our mission. Once the Israelites get refocused on their mission, that's when the second census takes place and the Israelites are set on the journey again, once again to the promised land. What's narrated in the book of Numbers, Simon Sinek has described in a really extraordinary TED talk that if you haven't seen it, I recommend it to you, 17 minutes long called Start With Why. He manages in that TED Talk to weave together Martin Luther King, the Wright Brothers, and Steve Jobs and Apple. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. But his point is that all three of those people, actually four if you count both Wright Brothers, but it's all three of those episodes in Steve Jobs' case, in the Wright Brothers, and with Martin Luther King, what distinguished them and led them to breakthroughs was that they started with why, not with what or how. In the case of Steve Jobs and Apple, Apple was a late entrant into the MP3 game. Dell was the pioneer leading MP3 players. When Apple came into it with the introduction of the iPod, they did it with a much clearer sense of why they were doing it and what purpose it would serve for the people who would use it. And now you know the word iPod, you don't know the word MP3 anymore. In the Wright Brothers case, there was a guy at the Smithsonian who was far better funded, who had far more credentials and reputation. The Wright Brothers were bicycle shop people from Dayton, Ohio. But for the guy in the Smithsonian, it was just a what and a how in terms of airplanes. For the Wright Brothers, they had a sense of the why that led them into deeper investigations of birds and how birds fly and aerodynamics. And they made the long journey from Dayton to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Read David McCullough's book, The Wright Brothers. It's an extraordinary story of their passion and the obstacles they overcame because they had that sense of a why. Or what Sinek points to in Martin Luther King, he said, you know, there were lots of black preachers who could preach powerfully. It wasn't that people gathered on the mall in Washington, D.C. in 1963 because they wanted to hear a great preacher. No, it was King's ability to tap into that deeper yearning, that sense of why that brought hundreds of thousands of people there. That's why the word that he spoke that day moved America because he tapped into that deeper sense of purpose and yearning and called us to what Lincoln would say is the better angels of our nature. Sinek argues the people showed up that day on the Mall of Washington not so much to hear King as to hear King give voice to their deepest yearnings and hopes for a better future. He tapped into that sense of why. Well, friends, I want to suggest to you that if you take the book of Numbers and Sinek and put it in the context of the United Methodist Church, We're mired in a lot of muck and preoccupied with a lot of fights because we've lost our sense of the promised land. We don't know how to answer the question of why anymore, and so we're stuck wanting to go back to Egypt. I preached at a church a while back and told the story of numbers as a context for my sermon. Later that week, I got my favorite letter I've ever gotten from a a lay person in a local church. He said, I don't know if you, were re- if you realized it, but you were preaching in Cairo. <laughs> I admired the honesty. He was willing to acknowledge how much the whole fabric of their life had been gotten stuck in Egypt. And here's the good news, though. The Wesleyan tradition, the people called Methodist, are better positioned to lay capture to answering that question of why and renewing our sense of mission and pointing us to the promised land if we'll only rediscover the genius that is embedded in our own identity and tradition and life. We are better positioned for 21st century challenges and opportunities than anybody else. If, as I'll suggest this afternoon, We overcome our amnesia and our nostalgia and recommit to that vision 
of what it means to bear witness to the God of Jesus Christ, to cultivate thriving communities that are signs, foretastes, and instruments of the reign of God. That's what got the people called Methodists going in the 18th century. It's what still happens around the world in pockets here and there, signs of hope on the horizon. The trouble is that too often, we've just lost sight of our own best insights, our own best story. And we've given up. There's a story of United Methodism in America, a history called, it's not a very good book, but it's a great title by Charles Ferguson. About 50 years ago, he wrote a book called Organizing to Beat the Devil. It was about the triumph of Methodists in America. But there's a problem that actually is diagnosed not just by Methodists, but by broader people like Andy Del Banco, a secular Jewish writer at Columbia University, has a book called The Death of Satan. His point is, and he thinks it's a tremendous loss for American culture, but he said, we've lost the imaginary for a sense of evil in the world. And the loss of that has meant that we've lost a sense of what's really at stake in American culture. And so it just seems as if now everything's just a little bit here and a little bit there, or who can have the most money, who dies with the most toys wins. We've lost that larger story. That's Del Banco's story. Charles Taylor's story in a secular age, which I don't recommend you read, but I do recommend Jamie Smith's summary of it called How Not to Be Secular. Taylor's argument is at the beginning of modernity, even the non-believers still thought there was a God. So you didn't really encounter atheists so much as you might encounter deists who thought God wasn't involved in the world, but they still thought there was a God, the non-believers. Taylor says at the end of modernity, even the believers act as if there's no God. We're essentially practical atheists. We organize our churches and our denomination as if we don't expect God to do much in the world. You know Annie Dillard's old line about having to wear a crash helmet at church because so much is happening? Not so much these days. When I became dean of Duke Divinity School 20 years ago, it was the first time in a long time that my wife Susan wasn't my pastor. And so when I'd hear complaints about the quality of preaching in the world, I didn't know what anybody was talking about because I heard good sermons every Sunday. But when we got back to North Carolina, we had places to visit on Sunday mornings. And we went to one church, and it wasn't a particularly good experience. It was just deadly dull. I was thinking about Annie Dillard as I listened to the pastor drone on, uninspired and uninspiring. But I just thought, okay, it's all right, just get through it. But on the way out, our son, our middle child, who at the time was uh, about eight years old, he looked at me and in a very unfortunately loud stage whisper said, hey, Dad. I said, what? He said, if the pastor doesn't want to be there, why should I? I didn't have an answer. We not only didn't need crass helmets, we needed those neck braces to avoid us from dotting off. How can that happen that a story that begins with the creation of a loving God and ends with a vision of a new creation, of a new Jerusalem where there'll be no more crying or hunger or dying, how can we turn that into something so uninteresting? It's astonishing. And yet, we've essentially become practical atheists. We've lost that sense of mission, that sense of why, that ability to know where and what we should be doing, what we're called to, and how that can lead us forward. What would happen if we really believed that the presence and power of God was about to break loose every Sunday in worship and the spillover of what broke loose there on Sunday morning was gonna happen all through the week. We just had Pentecost. What if we really recaptured that sense of what it means to bear witness to the God whose Holy Spirit is making all things new? We're going to talk this afternoon about what that looks like in terms of social innovation and the transformation of the world and of people's lives. But that's what has animated the people called Methodists 
all along the way was that sense of the power and presence of God that could change your life and change my life each and every day, could change the community of the church, could change the neighborhood around it, and indeed could change the world. In John Wesley's terms, it was spreading scriptural holiness across the land. These days, it seems we just think we've done okay if we've survived another week. We need to recapture that why that larger sense of the story. In Taylor's terms, we need to recapture the larger narrative from creation to new creation and a vision of what it means to live empowered and inspired toward that new creation. That's when transformation really occurs. When I was still at Duke as dean, I had a visit from a guy. We had a Center for Reconciliation project in East Central Africa. And there was a guy I'd met as part of our workshops and Center for Reconciliation activities in eastern Congo. And this guy had come to visit me at Duke. When we got that, when he came to visit me, it was in the afternoon, and he sat down. He was starting a university in eastern Congo. And I said to him, I said, "Uh, tell me about your university. He said, well, last year we had 200 students. This year we have 500. Next year we hope to have 800. In a few years we hope to get up to 5,000. I paused and I thought, wow, that's pretty audacious. I said, "Uh, what what makes you anxious or keeps you up at night? What is it that, that causes you to get discouraged? He said, oh, I don't get discouraged. I said, really? You're building a university in a war zone. He said, no, I don't get discouraged. Well, he said, no, no, I I did get discouraged once. I thought, oh, good. He said, I was driving through a war zone and I got stopped at a checkpoint and the 12-year-old who was at the checkpoint had an AK-47. And I've learned that sometimes you can talk adults out of using those kinds of weapons, but 12-year-olds really like to see what those weapons can do and so I was pretty convinced I was dead. He said, and when the guy, the kid actually let me through the checkpoint, I thought, oh, God has a purpose left for me. And so then I decided I better not get discouraged and keep focused on what God's calling me to do, and so hence the university. And that was two o'clock in the afternoon. I'd had a faculty meeting earlier that morning, so I think I'd been discouraged at least four times already that day. (laughs) But that's because I had lapsed back into managing an organization. I was no longer focused on the why. I was no longer focused on the presence and power of God breaking forth in fresh ways that could lead a university not only to be started but to be undergoing incredible growth in the midst of a war because he saw God at work. Now circle back to Del Banco and to Charles Ferguson. You see, Cotto also told me that they had to start the university in the health clinic because there was a war going on between the forces of God and the forces of evil, and he wanted to be sure that people knew the forces of God were more powerful than the forces of evil in the world. Once Methodists gave up that larger story of God and God's triumph over evil, we lost sight of Ferguson's organizing to beat the devil, and for the last four decades plus, we've been preoccupied with organizing for organizing's sake. We create restructuring proposals and reorganization as if somehow tinkering with the bureaucracy is going to fix what is fundamentally a mission problem. We don't have money problems. We don't have leadership problems so much as we have a mission problem of having given up on the vision of what it means to bear witness to the power of God, the kingdom of God, and how that breaks into our world in ways that changes and transforms lives. But friends, if we don't have to do something new, we have to do something renewed. We have to connect to who we are in ways that can break forth with possibilities for the future. Not because of who we are, but because of who God is. And the more we trust in God to lead us to the promised land, the more transformation will occur. But I'm going to warn you, it means we're no longer in control. And I'll tell you, that scares the daylights out of me. Because I like being a practical atheist. 
I know how to organize stuff. I know how to manage it. I even know how to work the system to make sure that the meeting comes out most of the time in my way. We'll talk some more about that this afternoon. (laughs) But the breakthroughs come, not when we trust who we are, but when we trust who God is. It's always a battle. It's never just brand new. And yet there used to be in American culture this sense that the people called Methodists were on the move. We created organizations and institutions that had a powerful evangelistic impact because it was about introducing people to the good news of the gospel and about the transformation of their lives. In that sense, Methodism was retrieving a much deeper and longer part of the story. It's what my colleague at Duke and good friend Kevin Rowe calls Christianity's surprise. He said, if you want to know why Christianity spread so much in the early church, it was because they trusted the power of the Holy Spirit to create new organizations and institutions. The first health clinics, for example, were founded by Christians in the third, second, third, and fourth centuries. Why? They took seriously the injunction that we're to care for the widow and the orphan and the poor. And that led to a spirit like Cotto had in eastern Congo of saying, if we trust God, we better start things even if it's in a war zone, even if it's at an inopportune time. A number of years ago, I was asked to speak at the sesquicentennial celebration at Valparaiso University. Been asked, I was asked in 2007, it was to speak in 2009. In the meantime, you remember there was a little event that happened in 2008 called the crash of the economy. So uh, as I was getting ready to go see them speak, to to go speak to them in early 2009, I finally realized I had to figure out what I was going to say. So I did some math and some research, and I discovered, well, sex was centennial in 2009, minus 150 years. Valparaiso University had been founded in 1859. By Methodists. It's now a Lutheran school. Methodists found it. We just gave it away. We've got a bad habit of doing that sort of thing. But a bunch of Methodists in 1859 had founded a college. Who in their right mind founded a new college in 1859? The country's on the brink of a civil war. The economy is in a shambles. If they'd had a long-range planning committee, they'd have said, this is a dumb time to do anything new. We need to hunker down and try to survive. But these were folks who were inspired by the gospel and who said, you know, if our people are going to have a future, we need to create institutions that will show that kind of transformation of life. So they founded a university. That's happened all across the United States, indeed around the world, where when people called Methodists have been trusting in the why, have seen the vision of God and trusted the power of the Holy Spirit, they've been inspired to do all kinds of amazing things. And then we shrink that imagination, get preoccupied with management and survival and fighting with each other and looking inward and battling with each other because we're no longer looking outward and upward to the God of Jesus Christ. We become as secular as the secularists, only with less creativity and a greater propensity for fracture. In 1904, people called Methodists started a hospital. It's it's a fascinating story. It was a story about a hospital founded in Indianapolis. There's one in Dallas, Houston, all over the country, high health care, educational institutions all across the country. The story that's fascinating to me is the one in Indianapolis because it came out of young people. The Epworth League had had a conference and they'd been doing a radical thing. They'd been reading the Bible and they discovered that Jesus said some things about caring for those who were sick and those who were poor. And so they went to the annual conference, and they went with a check of money they had raised. I don't know quite how they'd raised it, whether they'd had a a horse and buggy wash or something else, but (laughs) they went there. They had raised $4,750. That's a lot of money for youth to have, if they raised that much money today, Bishop McKee would be impressed. But in 1904, it was even more money. And they went and they said, 
here's $4,750. We think the conference needs to build a hospital. There was a speech on the floor of the conference from one of the senior members of the conference who said, I oppose this proposal. When is it going to stop? These requests for us to raise money and spend money and start new things, it's got to stop. Ever hear that speech? I'm afraid I might have given it a time or two. And then a younger pastor stood up and he said, with all due respect, if we're about the business of the kingdom, I don't think we're ever allowed to stop. Jesus didn't ever tell us that we would be done this side of the fullness of the kingdom. And this proposal gets to the heart of the gospel of what people of faith are called to be and to do, and we need to build this hospital. The proposal passed. Methodist Hospital was built. For most of the 20th century, Methodist Hospital was the largest health care provider in the state of Indiana until it merged with Clarion and now part of Indiana University Healthcare. All started because some young people read the Bible and said, you know, we probably ought to build a hospital. And lo and behold, the bishop and the conference came alongside him and said, you bet. Who'd have thunk it? Like Cotto in Eastern Congo, like Valparaiso University, like Methodist colleges throughout Texas, K-12 institutions, hospice organizations, people of faith have been at the forefront of social innovation, not because we learned about it in business school, more about that this afternoon, but because we've been focused on the why. I'm bearing witness to the God who has a land flowing with milk and honey. That vision of the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem, the power and presence of God made complete that we bear witness to day in and day out when we trust in God more than ourselves. A few years ago, I was reading about Muhammad Yunus right after he won the Nobel Prize and about the Grameen Bank. And I was struck as I was reading about it that so much of what he described about how they did microfinance in small communities. And I'm reading and I'm thinking, you know, this describes a lot. This sounds a lot like class meetings and bands of the Wesleyan movement. And then I went over and I was in Africa in Cote d'Ivoire and I started learning about how the United Methodist women in Cote d'Ivoire organized themselves into small groups for accountability and microfinance selling soap. And I began to realize that a secular Muslim from Bangladesh had just won a Nobel Prize for plagiarizing unintentionally from the people called Methodist. Imagine what could happen in Dallas and in North Texas and in the United States, much less in the majority world, if we reclaimed our own best insights, doing new things, not because they're new, but because they're part of who we are, discovering that Christian social innovation that bears witness to the God of Jesus Christ. It's always been what we've done at our best. Here's the catch. As my brother and I were sitting there in Cote d'Ivoire, Bishop Boney had all of his lay and clergy leaders in the conference around this very large table. And then he looked at us and he said, every one of us around this room are Christians because of health clinics and schools that once were started by the people called Methodist. Why have you stopped doing these things? All of a sudden you became Americans, Christians, I represented the entire Western world, it felt like. It felt like a bullet had just been put right between the eyes. He said, now it's the Muslims who show that interest. It's not the Christians who have that interest. What's happened? And I said, well, look at your own people and all they're doing. He said, yeah, we're, we're 
focused on that, but we need support and we need help. That's why we wanted to become United Methodists, to have that international presence and all we could do together internationally around the world to bear witness to that God. Will you join us? And all of a sudden I felt like I was now expected to speak for everybody. And all I could say is I hope and pray that we will. These days we need a kind of reverse innovation, a reverse evangelism, where we learn from our brothers and sisters around the world, Kato in Eastern Congo, the United Methodist women in Cote d'Ivoire, about what it means to believe in the power and presence of God, the power of the Holy Spirit to descend upon us. So we need to wear crash helmets even to annual conference or maybe especially to annual conference. If we get focused on the end, Because at the heart of the story of Numbers is the recognition that the end is our beginning. And if we can do that, then we'll discover not only that we're ahead of schedule, but also that we're on course. Thank you, Greg, very, very much. I'm going to entrust you into the arms or the hands of your nephew, Arthur. Good luck, Greg. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, again, thank you. Huh? <laughs> Arthur, thanks. So, Greg, thank you, and we look forward to hearing you this afternoon as well. Matt Miofsky's in the house. He'll be speaking this afternoon as well. Matt, can you stand where you are? So, I think you're in the house where you were. Oh, there you are. I'm Matt. We look forward to hearing you this afternoon as well. <coughs> Excuse me. This is where we are then on, on, the, on the agenda. We are at the point at which we're going to have some annou- a history and archive commission, correct, David? <coughs> oh, right now. Retiree videos right now. So if you'll... Uh, Direct yourselves to the screen, and then we'll look at the retiree videos. God has been creating in the church, in the local church and the church beyond. I have served in extension ministry and observed how God has transformed so many lives. One specific is I had an experience with a young man who was addicted to drugs and helped him process through understanding who God is and how much Jesus loves him, that he transformed and changed his life by submitting himself to Christ Jesus. And now he is 12 years clean. And we celebrate that because only God could make that happen. I see how the church has been effectively involved in the lives of the poor and at the same time, helping those who are lost to be able to attain a life, a fruitful life, while here on earth, using those gifts and graces within those persons to build God's kingdom here on earth. I'm excited about the fact that so, so many young people are coming to ministry to serve, not only as pastors, but to serve in the church. And my my hope is in them that Christ Jesus will use them to expand and grow our, our church to be what God created it to be. Everywhere I look today, every church where I have served, I see God expanding the ministry and the mission work of all the churches. God is changing the focus from being on ourselves to being on others. God is always doing a new thing. For us at First Plano, one of those ways has been in mental health ministry. The United Methodist Reporter had an article in the January-February 2017 edition about mental illness in which the author, Tricia Brown, stated that there is still a real stigma associated with mental health issues, even in the church. God began a good work at First Plano back in 2009 that is now Wellspring Counseling Center. Through sliding scale fees, the center's Christian counselors provide mental health services to persons and families that could not otherwise afford them. It's exciting to see how God created a passion in the heart of one person, Dr. Carolyn Moore, 
that sparked an entire ministry, one that meets a basic human need to be heard and understood, and through that process to be helped and healed. When I was in seminary, as late as 1994, we were still retrieving information from the green monochrome letters of the, the gopher servers, wherever they were. Now we carry around the world's libraries and art museums in our pockets the cultural changes that reality has made in our culture and in our churches is still being discovered. Obviously, it's a challenge that we're all dealing with, but, but God is the creator, and this is the continuing creation. We can be afraid of it or allow it to immerse us in hope. We have no excuse anymore for, for being ignorant about injustices happening with regularity to people down the street or about the, the plight of refugees in, in Syria or the Sudan. We can allow that knowledge to, to, to force us toward our neighbors in love or retreat into the always nearby tombs of, of fear. To follow Jesus means to follow Jesus. The fallacies of old confessional statements and, and denominational rules have become impediments to growing numbers of people and we must all, in, in our own ways now, be about following Jesus to the edges, then, then right up to the edges of, then into the abyss, into exactly those same places where Jesus didn't fit in either. It's both an alarming time and, and an exciting time. There are new questions about God, and, and hallelujah for that. There should always be more questions about God than answers. That makes life interesting and it gives substance. We are all pioneers in the community of heaven on earth. We need more poets and artists and cooks and carpenters and more young people who don't know or care about old rules but who simply want to follow Jesus. And I still see God creating a new ministry uh, in the life of especially lay people who come into the church and. Um, and learn their ministry, learn their place, their gifts and graces, and I've enjoyed uh, being able to mentor them, but also other clergy as well. I've worked with the intern program at Perkins over the last 25 years.